Today is our time to think about some things related to our beginning the new year with faith. And tonight in our TBS opportunity, we're going to to talk about that. We're going to think about the concept of faith as a foundational point for our lives. The text before us, I want you to think with me for just a few minutes, is a text that tells me this, take heed because there are no excuses. Now, when you hear about an excuse or when you make an excuse, what are you trying to do? Well, you're trying to avoid something. You're trying to turn the attention away from something. You're trying to get away with something. In other words, I'm trying to avoid responsibility. Now, that's what an excuse is. An excuse is saying, I don't want to take full responsibility for this. I might take a little, but I'm going to share it with this other thing or this other person, and I'm offering this excuse. When it comes to our faith, when it comes to the foundation of our lives, we better understand the concept that God says there are no excuses. I'm not going to listen to someone say, oh, I don't have the faith I should have because those people up there at that church don't live faith properly. They're a bunch of hypocrites. And God's going to say, what does that have to do with your faith. Oh, I don't have the faith that I need to have because uh, somebody offended me. They made me upset. They got me mad. And God's going to say, what does that have to do with your faith? Oh, but I was busy. I had a lot going on in my life. Got a lot of kids. Got a lot of responsibility. Things happening all the time. And God says, what does that got to do with your faith. People make excuses for all kinds of things. But can you imagine? Can you imagine the scenario where somebody one day is going to stand before the creator of the universe and they're going to say, Lord, here's my excuse. And he simply will say, what? What? You think you have an excuse for not being faithful? We better be careful to do what Paul said to Timothy. Notice, if you will, in this text that was read for us. Look at verse 16. The end of the text gives us the intro to the entire thing. Take heed to yourself. And to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing them you will both save yourself and those who hear you. Timothy was a a young man. He was being mentored by Paul to be a minister of the gospel. And Paul was saying to Timothy, you better take heed. You better take account of your life and you better stay in it because not only will you save yourself, but there are others that you will save if you will have them listen to you and you are faithful. God says through Paul to Timothy, there are no excuses. If you came here today with an excuse If you came here with an excuse as to why you can't worship as you should, as to why you can't serve as you should, as to why you're not doing something you should be doing, or why we're doing something we should not be doing, let's think about faith as our foundation for which there are no excuses. For context, will you back up with me in 1 Timothy 4? To verse number six. He tells us about our faith. He says, number one, 
take heed to your faith. Listen to some words that are found in verses 6 through 11 that will help us understand the concept of my faith as foundation. My faith is built on my investment. Notice verse 6. Instruct the brethren in these things. You will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Here's the word I want you to notice. Nourished. In the words of faith and the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Nourished by carefully following. Someone who is a diabetic must carefully follow a diet or their health could be destroyed. Someone who has heart trouble has to watch the diet and have exercise carefully following or health is an issue. All of us should have care about a diet, exercise, sleep, recreation, work. We must carefully follow that which nourishes us. Paul said to him, number one, you're going to invest in something to give your faith. And if you want to be nourished by your faith, you better make a good investment. Number two, my faith is based upon the things that I reject. He says in this passage, there are profane and old wives' fables. There are things that people just say all of the time that just are not right. And my faith is built on what I reject. How many times have you heard, I know I've heard it many, that so-and-so over here is being an influence on this person. Why are they not involved? Why are they not doing what's right? Why are they not living as they should? Because this person is being an influence. Why? Because they will not reject that. Maybe it's false teaching. Maybe it's a bad attitude. Maybe it's just a, a lifestyle of lasciviousness. Either way, when we let somebody else control, if I'm not able to reject some things, my faith will not be what it should be. Number three, exercise yourself unto godliness. What is my expectation? What are you wanting to accomplish? Paul says to Timothy, what do you want to accomplish? He says, exercise yourself toward godliness. My faith is going to be built on my expectations. What do you expect out of yourself? What should we expect out of ourselves? Am I going to have a greater faith than I expect to have? That's not even possible. Is it possible accidentally to have the faith you want? Of course not. Therefore, Paul is writing and he says, what is your expectation? What do you want? Because what you want will determine what you get. Verse 9, this is a faithful saying. But then verse 10. My faith is built on my endurance. To this end, we labor and suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God. He's the Savior of all men. Endurance. Has your faith ever been challenged? Have you ever had a difficulty staying the course? Have things bothered you in times past? Have people let you down? Have situations caused difficulty? What does he say? My faith 
is built upon the endurance that I have. Remember, James tells us that faith is tested, proven by the difficulties of life. Now, the foundation of my faith is mine. It's my faith. And I need to have my faith. And in order to have my faith, I am going to need to invest in it properly and reject things that are not right. And I need to make sure that I have a high expectation of myself, but go all the way to the end with it and do not quit. Take heed. There are no excuses. Have your faith. Number two, take heed to your reputation. Now, faith is what I think about God, and reputation is what others think about me. Notice what he said this for a long time in my early ministry. This was a verse I listened to all the time. Notice what he says, let no one despise your youth. What does he tell him? Timothy, don't let anybody look down upon you. Not that you should be viewed as a seasoned veteran. He's not saying that. He's not saying that you are the greatest and, and, and even the old heads who've been Christians for all these years, they ought to trust you. That's not what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. Don't give anyone a reason to look down on you because of three things. One, your actions. Don't let them look down on you because of your actions. You might be young, but act. Right, look at verse 12. Be an example of believers in word and in conduct. Notice how those two go together. Don't let anybody look down on you because you say one thing and do another. Have your word and your conduct be the same. Even though you are young, show them that what you say and what you do is the same thing. You don't have a hypocritical life. A lot of young people need to learn the lesson of standing up for what you believe. I know peer pressure is difficult. It is tough to stand in the face of those who are exactly opposite of you or who make fun of you. But you know what? Paul said, when you stand up, both word and conduct, eventually, people respect those actions. Number two, he says, don't let anybody look down on you because you have a bad attitude in love and in spirit. You say you love people, well then your spirit, the essence of who you are should be that. Are you a loving individual? Do people enjoy being around you? Do they feel better when they are around you? Do we help people rise up instead of pulling them down? I remember the the saying when I was young I heard a lot was, that person looks like they were raised on lemon juice. <laughs> you know what that's like, right? Don't, one of the things I enjoy doing with my kids, and I've done it with my grandkids, be at a restaurant and give them a lemon and say, this is really good, bite it. And man, when they do, and it just tears them up. Or... Hey, that's pretty good stuff. Some like it. I remember a, a young man who my father worked with some uh, adolescents who were having trouble. They were in a, a local school for boys, and he brought them to the house to work. And we had a, a tree, a persimmon tree. And this boy saw that, and he grabbed one. It was a green persimmon. He thought it was an apple. 
Well, now, if you don't know about persimmons, they got to be red and then they're sweet. But when they are green, they are not. Well, I saw him bite that green persimmon, and I saw one lip go under his chin and the other go over his nose. I mean, that was sour. You ever known anybody like that? You ever known anybody whose attitude looked just like that? Paul said, your reputation should not be that people are around you and they feel worse for having been there. Number three, faith and purity. Don't let people look down on you because your altitude is set too low. Now, we have people that work in the flight area at EKU. What happens if your altitude is set too low with an airplane? It's going to crash, right? You have to have it set. You have to know what your altitude is. Sometimes we just fly too low as Christians. Sometimes we try to fly just too low. Notice what he says, faith and purity. The highest things, counting on the highest things and staying with them. Fly as high as faith can take you. We're going to notice tonight about the mustard seed. Faith can take you really high. And the faith that you have that takes you high leads you to a purity of life that is higher than everybody else around you. He says, no excuses. You control your reputation. Look out for it. Take heed. But third, starting in verse 13, Take heed to your ministry. Your ministry now is what you think of yourself. Your faith is what you think of God. Your reputation is what others think of you. But your ministry is what you think of yourself. I am convinced that most of us think too lowly of ourselves. Now, Christians are supposed to be humble. I admit that. Christians should have a humble attitude. Uh, uh, We should be able to say that I am not looking to be known as the greatest and the best and to be arrogant and conceited. But guess what? It is false humility not to know who you are. Not to understand what you can do and say, this is what I can do. Let me do it. I really believe that men who serve as deacons should say to our elders, this is what I can do. Let me do it. That's an area I can do. Let me do it. And then our shepherds should say, get busy, we will leave you alone. Get busy. I think our shepherds should say, this is what we can do. When Paul wrote about the shepherds in 1 Timothy 3, it began with a curious statement. And the statement was about saying, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. And we've often said that the first qualification to be an elder in the Lord's church is to desire the opportunity. I don't believe that's what that text means at all. Here's what I believe it means. I believe it means there's a man who might say, The Lord wants men to shepherd his church. I believe I can do it. Let me serve in that capacity. And someone might say, well, that means you're not very humble because you say you want to serve as an elder. That's not what it says at all. It says you know what you can do, you have a talent, and you need to be serving. If you've managed people on a job... 
That's a talent you can put to service in the Lord. If you've been involved in working hard with people, alongside of people, that's a way to say, I can do this. Let me serve. People ought to look at themselves and say, I can teach Bible classes. Let me serve. I can work with young people. I can work with college students. I can work with seniors. I can work in the preschool. I can, and you fill in the blank. And we ought to say, this is what I can do. This is my ministry. Your ministry will be based on your effort, verse 13. He says, you better give attention to reading, to exhortation. To doctrine. If you have a ministry, put in the effort. Don't wait for somebody else to do your work because nobody can do your work. Nobody can do your ministry. Whoever you are and what you can do, that's your ministry. Put in the effort. Number two, it's based on your talent, verse 14. This gift that was given to him by prophecy and the laying on of hands makes it sound like Timothy was given miraculous gifts. Well, I surely believe that he was, but I don't think that's what this verse was about. First, it was the apostles who passed on miraculous gifts. Nobody else had the ability to do it. Who laid hands on Timothy in this verse? The elders. The word prophecy doesn't always mean telling the future. The word prophecy in its literal meaning means to tell forth. What happened with these situ this situation? The elders of the local church where Timothy was laid hands on him and said, you go forth with your talent and you minister. Our elders in a very real way, lay hands on people to say, here is your ministry, now get busy. Whether it is being deacons or Bible class teachers or whatever work you're doing, it's a great thing to know that these elders have laid hands on you to say, go and do it. When you are assigned or given an opportunity to minister, I think you should feel that the elders have done that. They've laid hands on you and commissioned you for the work. And that's what Timothy did. It was based on his talent. And finally, number three, it'll be based on your dedication. Meditate on these things, continue in them, don't quit. How dedicated are you to this ministry? Give yourself entirely to it. Your ministry is what you think of yourself. Now just here, what's your ministry for the Lord? What is your ministry in your private life? Meaning, what are you doing to minister to people every day where you are and what you do? Very important. Are you afraid to minister? Are you afraid to share? Are you afraid to broadcast the fact that you're a child of God and that you want them to be as well? But number two... What is your ministry in this church? 100% of the people in this church ought to have an identified ministry. I work in this area. I'm over here. This is what I do. I want to be involved here. Oh, I would love it. Our elders would love it if every single member here had a ministry that they were involved with and working with. You know why? Because it's what grows out of the foundation of your faith. So Paul said, no excuses. Have your own faith. Watch your reputation. 
and be busy in ministry. No excuses. Not taking any. Oh, but I can't. Maybe not there, but you can't over there. No excuses. If I'm busy offering excuses, then I am not busy living a faithful life. As we think about faith today, there's a way in which faith is the beginning, the, the elementary principle. Jesus said, believe in me or you're going to die in sin. And that faith leads you into repenting of sin and being immersed into Christ to have sins forgiven. But then the faith is a lifestyle that says, now this is how I'm going to live, faithfully to God. Guess what? God is sad when we're not faithful and we're not ministering. But the person you let down the most when you are not a faithful minister is yourself. The only one really that you're harming is self. So the question is, if you're not a minister, are you ready to be? If you've been ministering but not faithfully, are you ready to start? Today, our shepherds are willing to help you, to pray with you, help you begin or continue that journey. Will you come if you need to while we stand and sing together?